welcome to the worship of our Lord this Sunday, March 7th, 2021, the third Sunday of the season of Lent. This is Reverend Mary Goss, and I'm Reverend Bill Goss, and we'll be leading worship with you this morning. We're glad that you're here to worship with us. But first, let's share some announcements about things that are going on in the life of the church. Next Sunday, March 14th, marks Daylight Savings Time, the beginning of Daylight Savings Time. So don't forget to set your clocks forward um, so you aren't late to worship. <laughs> also, we realize that we've been making these worship videos and putting them out into the world, um, but we haven't taken into account that there may be folks that are watching and worshiping with us every week that are not members of Overbrook Church and may be interested in that. So we would like to invite you, if you have interest in life at Overbrook Church or maybe being a member of Overbrook Church, to reach out to us and contact us and we'll have a conversation with you and answer your questions and talk to you about what it might take to, to help get you uh, signed in and become a member of Overbrook Church. The contact information for Overbrook is in the can be found in the end credits at the end of this service. So just wait till the end, and one of those slides that scrolls by will have all the contact information you need. We look forward to hearing from you. Those of you who are here in the Columbus area, we are pleased to be able to offer set scheduled sanctuary times for you to come in for 15 minutes and sit in the sanctuary by yourself or with your spouse or family or your bubble that you are um, together with during this time and to spend some time in prayer um, inside the sanctuary. Those are times are by reservation only. They are on Mondays between 4 and 5.30 and Tuesdays between 11 and 1. And you can call the church office to make uh, those reservations. And also we want to remind everybody uh, that Overbrook Church is in the middle of a capital campaign right now. So we want to say a special thanks to all of you who have made pledges to that campaign and encourage all of you who have not yet to consider making a pledge. Uh, to help establish and continue uh, the work of this church going forward into the future. And also a reminder that you can find Lent resource, resources on our webpage. There's a banner along the top that you can click that says Lent. You can click on that and there are different options and ways that you can participate in Lenten practices. You can also find that link in our Wednesday email, our midweek email that comes out in your inbox at home. So if we were worshiping together in the same physical space, we would now stop and share the peace of Christ with one another. But we can't be physically together, so being virtually together, we want to share the peace of Christ virtually. So we encourage you to reach out over the phone to two or three people that you might normally see on a Sunday morning and share the peace of Christ with them, and then spend a few minutes catching up. So the peace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you, Mary. And also with you, Bill. And also with you. Let's worship God together. God has proven trustworthy throughout history, but at times we question and doubt and even deny God's presence in our lives. We forget the larger picture and focus only on that moment, on that period of time when we experience God's absence. We worry and fret about what is happening and what will happen next rather than trusting in our Savior. We light this third candle as a symbol of our faith in Jesus Christ, in our faith that his presence is always with us and that we are never alone. Come on, come on, come on. And can I blow them out now? Not yet, okay. Let us pray. Hold my hand. God of hope, Help us to remember the promise that you will never leave us or forsake us. As we journey towards the cross this Lenten season, remind us of your presence and help us to remember to trust in you. Amen. 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 Can I blow up the two candles now?
morning. I am here in my basement. Why am I in my basement? Because I was thinking about a year ago, this is where we started. About a year ago is when we had to shut down and close the church and start worshiping from our homes because it wasn't safe for us to be together. A whole year, a whole year where we didn't get to gather in the sanctuary or in the great room, the parlor, a whole year without being able to gather in our Sunday school rooms or youth rooms or the choir rooms, a whole year. That's a long time. But you know what I realized also when I was thinking about today? I realized we've learned a lot as well. And I have a book that I want to share with you. It's called This is the Church, and it's written by Sarah Raymond Cunningham. There's a little rhyme that children say, a song they sing sometimes when they play. This rhyme is about God's family. To do it, just move your hands like me. Here is the church. Here is the steeple. Open the doors and see all the people. What a great rhyme. Isn't it neat? But wait, this story is not yet complete. There's more to the church than just those two lines. To learn about God's family, let's add to the rhyme. Some churches are so big and wide, 10,000 people can fit inside. Other churches are really quite small. They fit just a few people, and that's all. Some people have church right where they are, right in their houses. That's not very far. And not all churches have roofs and floors. Some don't have steeples and some don't have doors. Some people have church under the stars and God comes and meets them right where they are. And in places where it's not safe to be found, some people even have church underground. And church isn't something that stands still, you know. The church follows God's people wherever they go. The church moves in buses, planes, and cars to share God's love. The church has gone far. The church works among the sick, hungry, and poor with people in need wherever they are. It's gone to cities. It's gone to towns. It's to school and to work. The church gets around. But how does this work? How can this be? Can a church really move like you and like me? That's the secret. It certainly can. Church moves through your feet. It works through your hands. The people are the church, don't you see? Church is a word for God's family. Because Jesus said, where there are two or three who gather in my name, that's where I'll be. So let's go back to the old rhyme now. Get your hands ready. We'll show you how. Here is a building. It may have a steeple. But where is the church? The church is the people. This whole last year, we have been unable to be in our building. We haven't been able to worship in our sanctuary or in our um, early worship space. We haven't been able to be in Sunday school or the choir rooms or the narthex. But we have been able to worship God over the internet, in our homes, sometimes in our church parking lot. We have been able to worship because we gather together in God's name. What a great thing we have realized this year. We've realized we miss our building a lot. And we realize we miss what happens in that building with us together. But thank goodness we have still been able to find ways to praise God and to tell God how amazing God is and to give thanks for God being with us wherever we are. Will you pray with me? Dear God, we thank you for this day for loving us in every way. Help us to love and not to fuss because we know that you love us. Amen. I hope you have a great week and I can't wait to be in worship with you soon.
Our scripture reading this morning comes from the gospel according to John. We're going to be reading from the second chapter of John, verses 13 to 22. So listen for the word of the Lord as it comes to us in the gospel according to John, chapter 2, verses 13 to 22. The Passover of the Jews was near, and Jesus went up to Jerusalem. In the temple, he found people selling cattle, sheep, and doves, and the money changers seated at their tables. Making a whip of cords, he drove all of them out of the temple, both the sheep and the cattle. He also poured out the coins of the money changers and overturned their tables. He told those who were selling the doves, Take these things out of here. Stop making my father's house a marketplace. His disciples remembered that it was written, Zeal for your house will consume me. The Jews then said to him, What sign can you show us for doing this? Jesus answered them, Destroy this temple, and in three days I will raise it up. The Jews then said, This temple has been under construction for 46 years, and will you raise it up in three days? But he was speaking of the temple of his body. After he was raised from the dead, his disciples remembered that he had said this, and they believed the scripture and the word that Jesus had spoken. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Let's pray. Gracious and merciful God, we give you thanks for this day and for this time together. And we pray that during this time, by the power of your Holy Spirit, you would open our hearts and our minds and our ears and our eyes, that we might hear your word anew and come to understand your will for our lives and for your church and for your world more fully. We offer this prayer in Christ's name. Amen. Today I want to talk about the great ends of the church. Now the great ends of the church is one of those documents, it's in our book of order, that's foundational to Presbyterians. It's a document that describes the primary purposes for the church's existence. And it's a document that most people in the pew probably know very little about. But if you're a minister, you very likely studied them in seminary. And there's also a good chance that during your ordination exam, you were asked to stand up and recite them. It happened to Mary. I was there. She was coming to Foothills Presbytery in South Carolina to be examined for ordination along with another candidate who had been a football player at Ole Miss. He went first, and when the time came, he was asked to name the great ends of the church, then choose one and discuss how it was expressed in his ministry. He named one and then spoke about it for a minute or so, and then he sat down. Now, it'll be instructional to mention at this point that there are, in fact, six great ends of the church. Maybe it's because he was a tall, good-looking ex-quarterback who looked the part, or maybe he made up for it in other ways, but no one questioned his omission, and he passed the exam with flying colors. When Mary's turn came, she was also asked the exact same question. Without hesitation, she rattled off all six the great ends of the church are the proclamation of the gospel for the salvation of humankind, the shelter, nurture, and spiritual fellowship of the children of God, the maintenance of divine worship, the preservation of the truth, the promotion of social righteousness, and the exhibition of the kingdom of heaven to the world. It was quite impressive, to say the least. There should have been more to her exam, but immediately one of the commissioners stood and asked to call the question. Mary had answered all of her other exam questions well, but when she nailed the great ends, that was a mic drop moment. By stating them all correctly from memory, she had shown that presbytery enough. Now, ministers don't go around reciting the great ends of the church for fun. They're, they're not some kind of password for a secret club, but they are important because they instruct our work as the church of Jesus Christ, because they remind us of what exactly it is that we're supposed to be doing here which is important because it's easy to get off course, to allow the work and rituals of the church to, to take on a life of their own, disconnected from their original purpose. That's what had happened in the Jerusalem temple in our scripture reading this morning. Now, in that story from John's gospel, Jesus goes to the temple in Jerusalem and chases out the merchants gathered there to change money and, and to sell animals for temple sacrifices. Most of us have heard this story before. And it's usually told as a righteous response to corrupt people doing corrupt things. But as is usually the case, there's more to the story than what we think we know. You see, the presence of merchants at the temple was not an inherently bad thing. 
They were there not to prey on religious pilgrims, but to help them and to facilitate their worship. Let's consider first that the temple in Jerusalem was not just another sanctuary. It was the sanctuary where humanity could most closely connect with God on earth. In ancient Israel, while they understood God's presence to be boundless, the Jerusalem temple was a special place where it was believed heaven and earth intersected. To truly draw near to God and worship in God's house, you had to come to the Jerusalem temple. Every Jewish male was required to pay a tax of one half shekel every year that was to be used for the upkeep of the temple. The problem was that Roman coins all featured images of Caesar, which made them no good for use in God's temple. So to facilitate paying the tax and thus keeping that law, Temple authorities provided an exchange where pilgrims could swap their Roman coins for something more suitable. Imagine if the church today had some sort of rule against accepting paper money. We'd still pass the offering plate and ask worshipers to contribute to the work of God's church, but we would also probably install a change machine in the narthex to help make that possible. Providing a currency exchange service wasn't a move designed to defraud or or turn a profit, It was intended to facilitate obedience to the law. Much like selling animals was intended to facilitate worship. From early on in Israel's history, sacrifice and burnt offerings were an important part of worship. You may remember that the dramatic conflict between Cain and Abel all the way back in the fourth chapter of Genesis grew from their different offerings to God. Abel offered to God the firstlings of his flock. Cain offered to God the fruit of the ground. And all through the Old Testament, offerings to God are made by killing an animal or by burning produce or pouring pouring out wine on the altar of the Lord. The Levitical codes go to great lengths to explain what kinds of sacrifices are required for which festivals and, and to atone for various sins. There's even a sliding scale of sorts for those who could not afford the bigger, more expensive offerings. One thing, though, that remains consistent across these stories and codes of law is that the offerings are to be free from blemish or defect. In other words, they had to be as close to perfect as possible. No fair saving the best for yourself and offering to God what you got left over. But think for a second about how hard it would be to transport an animal, a sheep or a bull, for sacrifice all the way to Jerusalem, especially if you lived far away. The longer the trip, the more likelihood for the oxen or sheep or whatever it was to pull up lame or get mauled by a wild animal. Ever try to carry a casserole or a cake to a party? The longer the drive, the less appetizing it is when you get there. It's the same principle. So to make life easier for pilgrims, the temple authorities offered to just sell them an animal to sacrifice. And for a lot of people, it would have been far easier to purchase what they needed for worship after they got to Jerusalem anyway. This was a pastoral response to a real problem of how to make sure your sacrifice was as perfect and acceptable as possible. And providing the things you need for worship isn't that strange of an idea. For instance, most of us have a Bible at home. We could easily bring it with us to follow along with the readings in worship and Sunday school. But sometimes people forget and leave their Bibles at home. And sometimes your Bible has so many pictures and newspaper clippings and children's artwork stuffed inside that to open it up and read it is to have family heirlooms spilling out all over the floor. So when you worship here in the church, the church provides Bibles for you. In this video you're watching right now, I posted the scripture right there on the screen for you to read along with us. It's a considerate way to help make worship possible providing a currency exchange, selling sacrificial animals. It all makes sense when you think about it, when you really understand the problems worshipers would have faced in that day and time. So, if all this is on the up and up, why is Jesus taking such radical steps to clear the merchants out of the temple and chase away the animals? And what does he mean when he says, stop making my father's house a marketplace? Well, the answers can probably be chalked up to human sin, and to temple authorities and merchants forgetting why they were there in the first place. See, over time, the practice of exchanging money probably begins to take on a more business-like tone. The selling of animals becomes an end in itself. 
Maybe these merchants and money changers, having made a humble living in the temple, decide to start maximizing their profits, which eventually maybe becomes outright cheating. When Matthew, Mark, and Luke tell this story, they all quote Jesus as referencing Isaiah 56, verse 7, when he says, My house shall be called a house of prayer for all nations, but you have made it a den of robbers. So maybe there is an element of fraud in the business that goes on there. But there's another possibility that would be even more instructive for us in this church. And that is the possibility that in the Jerusalem temple, the original intent of the currency exchange and the selling of animals had been forgotten. Those businesses had become the primary focus. And what got lost in all the buying and selling and profit making was the worship of God that those cottage industries had been established to make possible. You see, sometimes we run the risk of getting so wrapped up in our roles and businesses in the church that we can forget what all of that is supposed to facilitate. We can get so focused on our special projects or our favorite ministries, and in our desire to do them well or make them better, we we can forget the God those projects and ministries were supposed to be in service of. We do stewardship campaigns and capital campaigns and membership drives and coat drives and food drives. We provide meals for the hungry. We have choirs and ministry teams and committees and youth groups and fellowship events. We do elaborate worship services and provide Sunday school programs and Bible studies. And in this day of COVID, we put hours of work into producing virtual worship videos to post online and virtual fellowship activities. And we make rules to guide our time together and we institute policies and we do work. But every single bit of that is meant to serve the kingdom of God. And if it doesn't, if any part of it doesn't, then as the church of Jesus Christ, we shouldn't be doing it. Remember, the great ends of the church are proclaiming the gospel, nurturing the spiritual growth of God's people, worshiping God, preserving God's truth, doing justice, and being living examples of God's kingdom. That list doesn't include attending meetings or balancing the budget, or maintaining a building, or increasing membership. Doing those things may help us to facilitate the purposes of the church, but in and of themselves, they are not the point of the church. I had someone tell me once, we need more members because we need the contributions to help our bottom line. No, 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 that's not why we invite people to church. We're not in the business of building a membership role. We're in the business of building disciples of Jesus Christ. Now, don't get me wrong. It is still wise to institute sound business practice. It is wise to care for and maintain all the resources that we've been given. But those things serve the ends of God's church, not the other way around. We are in the middle of a capital campaign right now the purpose of which is to raise money to help repair our building. But the point of repairing our building is to facilitate the ministry and discipleship that we do here. And it can be really easy to forget that, to fall into the trap of of maintaining a building for its own sake. We're not raising money to make sure this building doesn't fall down around us. We're raising money to make sure that the ministry we do here continues into the future. We're conducting a campaign to help make sure that the last hundred years of work towards the kingdom of God, the powerful spiritual experiences generations of Christians have had here, the word of God that is proclaimed here, the love of Christ that is shared here, can continue to grow and bear fruit for the next hundred years and more. You see, that's why we do the work of the church. That's why we fundraise and and volunteer and serve, not because those are good things to do in and of themselves, but because they help to facilitate the coming kingdom of God. And that's why Jesus raised a ruckus in the temple. Because the things happening there had been started for the purposes of helping doing God's kingdom work. But that work was eventually forgotten, and other priorities, other motives had taken hold. If Jesus walked into our church today, would he be pleased with what he found? Or would he start flipping over tables and challenging our motives and our priorities? In this season of Lent, 
during this time of self-reflection and repentance, it is good for us as a congregation to examine what we do and why we're doing it. What are the great ends toward which we are working? It is good for us to re-examine those motives and priorities and make sure that what we are doing, we are doing for God's glory, not our own. That what we are doing, we do not for our own edification, but for the kingdom of God. Everything we do in the church should be directed towards that great end. To God be all glory, honor, power, and dominion in this world and in the world that is to come. Amen. together in prayer. God of amazing grace and boundless compassion, you call us into your fold and welcome us just as we are. And for your unconditional love for each and every one of your children, including ourselves, we give you great thanks. We know, O oh God, that you are present in each and every moment of our lives, but still we continue to seek you as we face a world that feels so very overwhelming. We pray this day over the deep division that has settled into our nation. Violence by words and actions erupt daily as injustice in so many forms continue. We pray for our government and leaders to model kindness in their disagreements, maturity in their conversations, and to do the very hard work of finding ways forward that seek the good of all people. We pray for the very systems in our world that have created injustice, that they might be righted, and for all of our actions to help make it so. And we pray, O oh God, for guidance and wisdom and initiative to move forward in ways that bring justice and unity for all. As our pandemic continues, we lift up the 500,000 families who are grieving the loss of, a love, of loved ones and give thanks for those who work to provide care for all who are ill. We have prayers of strength to our first responders and wet medical community for their mental and physical exhaustion. May they know your unconditional and sustaining love, O oh God. And while we offer thanksgiving for the vaccine, may we have tolerance within its delivery and fairness in its distribution. As we move into this time of this now and not yet with our immunity, may each of us act with patience 
and thoughtfulness with all of your children in mind. As always, O oh God, we pray for those who are hungry. May they find nourishment. We pray for those who are hurting or ill. May they find help. For all who are weary, grant them rest. For all who are fearful or anxious, may they know peace. And for all who feel alone or unloved, may they find an abundance of your love. We pray these things with humility, knowing the love you have shown us through the love of your Son, Jesus the Christ, who taught us to pray together. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Well, that concludes our service for this morning. Thank you for joining us, and thank you for worshiping with us. Now, let us go and return back to our journeys from which we turned aside to be here. Remembering that as the church, everything we do, is for the glory and the purposes of God's kingdom. Now go, and as you go, may the grace of God the Father, the peace of Jesus Christ, God's Son, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be and abide with us all, now and forever.